Good morning and good <clears throat> or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Rami Karamaziz. Uh, I'm currently the head of microbiology and immunology uh, research program at the Children's Cancer Hospital of Cairo, Egypt. I'm also a, a, a professor in Cairo University. Um, so today I'm, I'm really excited to, to share with you a presentation uh, about pharmacomicrobiomics. Uh, which I will hope in, within the, the next 30 minutes I will be able to define and to suggest how we can translate that into, uh, into the clinic, into clinical applications and pharmaceutical uh, applications as well. So basically, uh, my title is Translating Pharmacomicrobiomics uh, from a Microbiome Cloud of Uncertainty to Pharmaceutical and Medical Applications. All right, so I like to start. I, I know uh, this is uh, semi interactive. <laughs> you, you, you can hear me, but I cannot hear you at the, at the time being, or, or not at the same moment at least. But I, I'm assuming that you can uh, raise hands or answer this quiz. Uh, if, if you were in a, in a lecture hall, I would ask you like this picture, which hopefully you can see. Uh, basically, how does it relate to the session uh, title? The, microbiome and precision medicine. So my question is, how do you think this relates to precision medicine? How does it relate to the human microbiome? Uh, you may have very good idea about what precision medicine and human microbiome are, or you may wait until we discuss their definitions, but really just take a moment, maybe not on a small piece of paper or just make, take a mental note of how is this related? Like this looks like some targets, Somebody is shooting at them or, or throwing darts. So, so how is this related to the human microbiome and precision medicine? The first third of my talk will be to talk about the human microbiome and the human microbiome project or HMP and how it all started and how we got into this field of pharmacomicrobiome. So basically, uh, microbiome is obviously microscopic microbiology and Microbiology itself is a, is a quite recent field. This is a picture of Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who, who was maybe 350 years ago. The first time uh, with a small microscope he invented, it, it gave him new eyes. However, the, the invention remained buried maybe for another couple of hundred years. So what, the entire microbiology field is less than 170 years old. And it was all giving us new eyes because of the microscope. Later, like in the mid, middle, middle of the 20th century, we discovered DNA and DNA sequencing later and started having, again, new eyes uh, to be able to see what we cannot see with, with the microscope, even using DNA sequence and DNA fingerprinting. And obviously, to, to everybody, the, the human genome uh, sequence came out in, well, it, it has been fully achieved maybe this year with all the details, but since the start of the, the new century, the 21st century, the, the human genome was out there, was announced in 2001 as a draft, both in science and nature, and it, it, it caused a revolution since then. However, the, the human genome was supposed to tell us why we are different, as you can see on the science cover, why, why people from different colors, different ages, different races, different. Uh, however, the differences could not all be explained in our genes. There are other differences in how we look and how we respond to disease and how we respond to therapy as well. So later, th there were so many uh, regulatory factors, like we look at gene regulation, for example, but again, there is still a missing part. And that was one of the missing parts was the human microbiome. The human microbiome was popularized very well in, in the the early decade, first decade of the century, like 2005, 2006, we started hearing about the human microbiome and it took a few years to make it to the press. So this, this cover is actually from The Economist, except I wrote on it, 10 to the power of 13 is the number of our human cells. 10 to the power of 14 is the scale of number of uh, nucleated microbial cells. Uh, and so our nucleated cells are one order of magnitude less than, than the microbial cells living within us. And you can see this title in The Economist, Microbes Makes Men. So are, are we fully human? 
when we are carrying more microbial cells from different uh, origins, different microbes, different genomes. It, it was the question of uh, the decade at the time. So uh, again, let me start uh, by defining the terms so that uh, we're all on the same line, whether you're new or you're you're an expert of the microbe. The term microbiome was, was suggested by Joshua Lederberg in, in, to, in the year 2000, describing the, the sum of microbial genomes living in our body, and it, it was suggested as an extension of the human genome. However, microbiome can also be seen in two ways. So the first one is the summation of microbial genomes, or it could be also seen as the microbial metagenome, which is all the microbes in, in a certain environment, which is the different environment in our body, or it can be seen as the micro of the biome, the microscopic part of the biome or the living system. And, and both of these have been suggested by us and others. Uh, one of the articles you can go to is uh, in gut pathogens and the link is provided here. So it's really important to define the terms and this is uh, what Joshua Lederberg used in the year 2000. Uh, before that, you cannot really find the word microbiome on uh, the word microbiota was used a lot to describe the, the sum of bacteria living in human bodies, but the word microbiome was maybe mentioned only once or twice in, in, in very sporadic terms before the year 2000. The other thing which I really, really think uh, would be interesting is, is what is the microbiome really looks like. Uh, and here I, I want to show you a, a few pictures. You can uh, you can pick which one of them describes the microbiome best. So there there is the the picture that is mostly common now is the microbiome as a, an extra organ or a forgotten organ. It's a second brain or it's second uh, liver. Uh, however, uh, maybe this picture of the microbiome as a different organ is is quite fragmented because an organ is after all. Uh, from the word organ, it's organized, it's inherited, it's stable more or less, you know, except for our immune cells, most of our organs are quite genetically stable as well. Uh, the alternative model that I, I would like to suggest would be a microbiome cloud model. And this is inspired by the uncertainty in the, in the atomic structure, uh, the uncertainty principle and how the electrons can be in a cloud. So I'm trying to visualize, and this was inspired by an article in the Scientific American, actually. So this illustration is like a human with a microbiome density around it. So in the gut and the, the oral cavity, we have the highest density of microbes, but also on our skin and elsewhere. But if you come uh, 10 minutes after the microbes have already changed, uh, a few days after they have changed, there are hormonal factors, uh, there are geographical factors, there are diet factors, there are inter-individual factors. So there is so many factors that make uh, the microbes different around our body. So what what you what microbes you had yesterday are different from what you had today and significantly different if you, you got uh, a diarrhea, for example. Now, this is really important to consider. So these microbes are not, there are so many, they have genomes, but they are not as genetically stable as we imagine. So this is the message of the first part of my talk, basically. We, we are inhabited by a, a huge cloud of, of genomes and, and this cloud is, you know, not just figuratively, but actually literally, we have a cloud of, of bacteria surrounding our skin, but also again, in all our cavities basically. And they contribute a lot of genes and these genes at some point will be expressed and they will perform functions. So they definitely enrich our gene pool, but they enrich it in a way that is uncertain. And this is the first part of, of my talk and the first part of the title. There is an uncertainty of the microbiome. And now I go back to the slide I started with, you know. So how is this related to the human microbiome? Basically, I just defined the human microbiome as a cloud. So let's say um, you, you want to reach, you, you just want, you get some food in your body. <clears throat> this food gets metabolized by our enzymes, but there is also a cloud surrounding our enzyme, which is the microbial enzyme that differs again uh, on different days of the year. It differs according to our diet, even our mood sometimes. Uh, so how is this related again to, to precision medicine? And how, how can we explain this cloud first and decode it? 
So the, the second part of my talk is about the decoding of the human microbiome, which is, is more or less about the bioinformatics behind it. And decoding is a very, very old activity. It dates, I mean, to archaeology and when people uh, you know, find manuscripts or old pap papyruses, and they start trying to make a story. And often the, the long stories that we studied in, in, in the history books, they actually come from fragmented, very fragmented uh, pieces of manuscripts. But we can tell, like, the king went to a certain war, and then you can guess from the rest of this, even if some words are missing, you can make the entire story based on other manuscripts and, and other events. And this is what basically everybody who works on genomics and metagenomics does. We get a lot of DNA uh, letters, you know, the DNA alphabet, the ACGT, and we try to make sense out of them to try to build a single story. So, so my first experience, and, and here I'm going to mix some of my experience as well with, with the concept, because I, I don't want this to be just a theoretical, <clears throat> theoretical lecture, but also, uh, so, so one of the works I have been earlier involved in since 2005 and 2006 was trying to make sense out of microbial genomes. And at the time, there were not that many. They were less than 500 microbial genomes in the databases. Today, they are, I don't know. I, I don't want to say millions, but there's so many microbial genomes. Uh, and there, had, there was a need to human expertise, but also to micro, uh, computational uh, uh, tools, because no human can take one genome and annotate 5,000 genes, for example. That, that's typically the E. coli genome, one of the commonest bacteria. Uh, the mycobacterium tuberculosis have even more genomes, and I, I can name a lot of bacteria that have uh, more genes in, in them. Uh, than any human can handle just mentally or, or can claim knowledge of. So uh, instead, we we always needed computer systems. However, again, a computer system alone can be disastrous so, because it, it cannot do all the predictions without very clean databases of human knowledge. So one of the earliest attempts, and it's one of the uh, most successful until now uh, tools, is the RAST server, which stands for Rapid Annotation Using Subsistence Technology. And it was used to interpret individual genomes. But later there was MGRAS, there were other derivatives uh, to interpret genomes in a microbial community. But again, why is the computer not enough? There is a risk. Uh, there is a big risk, uh, uh, for example, if, if you just take a, a very classical biology example, you go to a forest and try to name some of the creatures there, some of the organisms, and you find all these four pieces. And now we try to assemble them without any human knowledge. If a, if a computer tries to assemble these four parts, it may fall in a very common so-called chimer. And, and, and this chimer could be very attractive, but it doesn't exist. So when, when, when we are interpreting stories and building models, we have to make sure uh, they actually represent reality and truth. And what, one of the applications of the success model of using computer assembly with human knowledge was the discovery of a microbiome-related virus, which is a microbial virus that uh, we named Crassphage, and this was discovered in 2013 and published in 2014 in Nature Communications. And it made a lot of news because this virus is a microbial virus. It doesn't infect humans. It infects the microbes uh, in our intestine. And it was surprising that like all our history, we could not find this virus, and it turns out to be a, a, a big family of viruses called the crass like viruses. And many of them live in the guts of humans, others live in the guts of, of primates. And it was not discovered until that time. Why? Because most of the genes did not look like any other genes, and it needed smart microbial assembly, which was only available with the technology of the time, and uh, of course, human knowledge of the system. So now we know that this crass phage is, is very highly spread uh, in different continents with different variants. I don't want to go through so much technical details, but when you are trying to interpret microbial genomes, uh, you fall into some easy parts and some less easy, some challenging parts. So parts of the genomes that are easier to interpret are those that encode the enzymes that uh, like perform the metabolic functions. Uh, uh, Everything that we studied in biochemistry basically is, is re relatively easier to interpret because the enzymes are conserved and the genes are uh, are well defined by, by all the biochemists throughout the ages. How, however, the, the, ch the more challenging parts are the so-called mobile elements, the jumping genes, 
plasma medicine exposures. They are very important to interpret. So we, we work with Rob Edwards and Maya Breibert, whose pictures you can see in this slide on defining transposable elements and, and bacteriophages also, which are again, bacterial viruses, because they are uh, the variable variable elements in microbial genomes. And some of the plasmids and, and, uh, and these uh, transposable elements, they carry resistance genes. So again, it was, it's very important. And this is again, a part of uh, what I'm interested in and what I worked on uh, a few years ago uh, in collaboration with Dr. Rania Siam and Ali al who, uh, who are pictured in this slide, uh, we improved the resistance uh, prediction in microbial genomes, and we call this resistome estimation. Now, the, one, one last issue about the interpretation, and then I will move to the third and, and last part of my talk. So again, the, the first part of my talk was about the concept of the microbiome. The second part is how to technically interpret it and how not to fall into traps or make mistakes by assembling the wrong pictures, you know, the, the wrong uh, data from, from the information we have. Uh, so now there is a big debate and, and it's, it's not like uh, a philosophical one but it's more like a microbiological uh, are we more interested in who they are or what they do and here i'm talking of course of they about microbes that inhabit us so, so some scientists would spend a lot of time on taxonomy and dividing and, and, and uh, classifying all the microbes in our body uh, while others are more interested in the functional part and it, it's really important to understand uh, why each is important. I mean, so uh, like you can say it's not what you do, but who you are uh, in, in social life that may be interesting. But for bacteria, it's really uh, since we are, you know, we are humans and we are interested in what bacteria do to us. This slide is uh, it's quite complicated. I don't want to go through it in detail, but I want you to check the upper part and the lower part. Uh, you can see the lower parts are very, uh, you know, the patterns are very similar, right? So there is red, blue, and they're more or less similar. These are the microbial functions performed by the bacteria in uh, several twins and their mothers. So the twins are similar to one another, but also similar to other twins on how their bacteria function. But if you go to the identity of these bacteria or to the identity of viruses there, you will find a lot of discrepancy. And, and what is the message here is you may have a lot of layers that are different, but they perform the same function. It's more like a team, a sports team. So you have defenders and you have uh, you have midfield, like whatever the sport is. I don't want to be biased to football or soccer, but basically it doesn't matter who the player name is, but this guy is going to score, this guy is going to defend, and this guy is going to be a playmaker and so on. It doesn't matter if it's Streptococcus or Staphylococcus. Uh, I mean, it matters definitely for taxonomists, but for, for the sake of the human uh, uh, metabolism and human health, whatever, whoever is there, what matters more is what functions they do. And it, surprisingly, this inspiration was uh, there 100 years ago. 100 years ago, the microbiology was all based on microscopy and culture. There was no DNA analysis. And this is a paper from uh, now 110 years ago, basically from 2000 and uh, from 1909, and I discovered it in, in 2009 and, and published a, a short commentary on it. Uh, I was very happy to find this paper because it says that a considerable portion of fecal mass is made up of the bodies of bacteria, whether they are dead or alive. So all our yeah, this this inspiry, like this insight, was there since 1909. That most of our our body, uh, our fecal material in, in the abdomen is made up of bacteria and, and it's like a huge incubator inside us. And what is really inspiring here and, and insightful is it's what bacteria do rather than what they are that commands attention since uh, our interest center on the host here, which is the human rather than the parasite. So this was seen by Theobald Smith, very insightful and published in JBC, who, who are thankfully keeping the records for 100 years and open access as well. So this is really interesting. So again, message number one, we have a microbiome cloud of uncertainty surrounding us. Now decoding this cloud is even more challenging. So you already have a cloud, there is uncertainty, but even decoding it is challenging. However, what is a little bit comforting is that you don't really have to know every member of the microbiota to be able to understand what they do. If we can just assess their functions by finding the gene sequences 
uh, and analyzing them, we can try to predict the functions and biochemical pathways they perform. Now I want I want to move on how is this related to our health and then then to get straight to the medical and pharmaceutical applications. So the human microbiome uh, has been now popularized for 20 years, maybe almost 15 or yeah 15 years of press about the human microbiome. Most people know that microbiome can control a lot of our functions, not only the diet and assimilation, but sometimes our mood, sometimes our response to, to different stimuli. And this is all based on a dysbiosis and uh, eubiosis paradigm. So basically, very simply, it's, it's more about war and peace or more about, you know, there is balance and peace on the upper picture here in the intestine. The bacteria are in the right proportion. There is not there is not a single uh, like ideal microbiome for every human, but more or less whatever keeps the bacteria in peace together, uh, in a metabolic uh, synergy or, or symbiosis with the host. However, when when our diet changes, when some fac other factors change, or when we are stressed, when the bacteria are stressed, when we eat uh, a lot of junk food, this balance will change, and sometimes it, it's fatal. Like sometimes it changes to a uh, a dysbiotic state, so it's like utopia and dystopia. So it's a dysbiotic state in which uh, there is a favor of, of causing disease. So there is a stage before disease called dysbiosis, where you are in imbalance. And uh, in this stage is luckily reversible. So here the, the disease is colorectal cancer, and, and it, it could be uh, really quite obvious that colorectal cancer uh, has a microbial factor, and, and it's especially by bacteria called fusobacteria, for example, and some types of E. coli. All right, so, so I want to, to mention a couple of, of examples from my research. And Mariam is one of my students, for example, and she looked at dysbiosis in the eye, and she found, again, uh, to make a long story short, that dysbiosis in uh, a disease called conjunctivitis is very significant. So you don't have to have bacteria coming from the outside causing conjunctivitis, even if there is a minor injury to one of the two eyes, uh, th that eye will start getting a dysbiosis, the balance will, will be uh, broken in, in the eye, and then some bacteria will prevail that will cause the conjunctivitis, while the other eye is still not infected. So by comparing the two eyes, she managed to look at that. Uh, another student of mine looked at a disease, uh, since I am in Egypt, and Egypt is one of the countries that is most affected by hepatitis C. And currently, uh, there is a huge effort to eliminate the disease, but it, 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 we are still an, having hepatitis C as an endemic disease. So, uh, Abdurrahman performed a, a quite uh, preliminary and pilot study, but luckily it was confirmed by so many studies after that. And he found that there is it, just look at this uh, blue and, and red dots. The red dots represent people who are infected, the blue dots represent people who are healthy. And almost all the red dots except one, there is always exceptions in biology, uh, are separated from the blue ones, which means their microbiome composition is different. So my, uh, my third message here uh, is that uh, microbes play major functions that affect our health. And uh, definitely, if any food we eat, any natural products, any prebiotics will affect our health. So now, how about drugs? I mean, if we are talking about health, then drugs come immediately. If the microbes have this strong metabolic capacity, they can break down products and they can even deal with toxins. And if we have this cloud of microbes inside us and around our skin, how can they relate with drugs? And it, it, it's really important uh, to know that drugs and microbes are very in a very old relation. Even before the discovery of bacteria and microbes, we have been eating microbes as drugs, like just think of all the yogurt with probiotics that we eat. And we have been producing a lot of drugs. The most, of course, the popular of them is antibiotics that come from bacteria and fungi. So microbes and, and drugs are, are very well connected, actually, bugs and drugs. But now we, we are facing, like, here is a small, like, a small conceptual or philosophical thing. So you, you're targeting precision medicine. And precision medicine means you want to treat every patient in the most optimal way like treat or prevent a disease, uh, taking into account genes and environment and lifestyle. And now you cannot ignore one major uh, factor, which is the microbiome. So going back to, to my very, very first slide or like the, the quiz I gave you, 
you want to target you know you have a target you want to shoot there you want to hit the the, the bull eye however you are blind basically we are blind because we cannot see these microbes we cannot read them we need dna sequencing to read them but also because they are changing so you are shooting in a fog you know you are targeting and this is why the first slide relates or how it relates to precision medicine you're trying to shoot here and hit the, the highest precision while it's foggy and even the fog thickness changes so uh, again back to the uh, microbiome cloud model and i hope i'm not here getting into so much concept but very very simple like just think of the sun and the clouds right when the, the weather is cloudy it's masking most of the sun beams uh, different different organisms will react differently so mosquitoes for example they don't like the light very much but some flowers like the light very much so if your cloud is thin so here if the microbiome cloud is thin a certain drug, and we're just here talking about drugs, can have different effects on different targets. And the same drug is used, but with a different microbiome composition, different microbiome cloud, these creatures here, or these, I mean, targets here will act differently. So when there is more sun, the sunflower is happy, the mosquito is not. When there is less sunlight, the mosquito is happy. The sun. I mean, just a simplistic example. Now, if you change your drug, another complexity, so let's say you change from drug A to drug B because it's causing you side effects. Again, well, drug B may be like the moon, so it will have different effects on different targets, but it's also not just the drug and the target, but there is a third factor here, which is the microbiome cloud. And why it's a cloud? Because it changes all the time. It could be there, it could be absent, it could be thick, it could be thin, and so on. So this... Uh, this kind of brings my talk to the to the you know the the topic the main you know epic point here is that we are looking at human response to drugs and initially we know that the human genes can so this slide shows if you're seeing it here like look at the different arrows every gene or transcription factors in our body uh, could be different from one person to another and that's why there was a so-called pharmacogenetics and with the human genome achievement. We know that pharmacogenomics is the science that studies or the field that studies how the entire composition of our genome may make me respond to drugs uh, and in a very good way. Another person responds to them uh, very slowly and the third person actually gets food, gets, gets intoxication or gets a, a side, huge side effect. Now add an additional layer of microbes like this big cloud surrounding our genome. So now uh, this is how we started uh, the term pharmacomicrobiomics. And this started with a key paper that was in a small journal uh, in 2010 by Scala and, and colleagues. And uh, we suggested the term pharmacomicrobiomics as, uh, you know, how the drug, the different pharmaco, uh, the, the word pharmaco is Latin for drug, how they are affected by the microbiome and how they affect the microbiome as well. So very quick definition of terms. So pharmacomicrobiomics, we mean by it is how our human microbiome and its variation. So how two different people with two different microbiomes will dif respond differently to drugs and how two drugs can uh, modulate our microbiome. It's very related to pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenetics. A term, a close by term is toxicomicrobiomics. Is again, how our microbiome can affect how we respond to different toxins in the environment or pollutants. We call them xenobiotics. There are other derivatives, pharmacometagenomics, pharmacometabolomics, pharmacometabonomics with an N. And I don't want to go too much into details, especially that my time is coming up, but you can read about this in uh, Expert Opinion Drug Metabolism in 2018 in, uh, in a paper uh, entitled Drug Pharmacobiomics and Toxicomicrobiomics. But basically, we are humans, we have our genes, we have the microbial genes, and this affects uh, the drugs we take. So how we can analyze this, we can just ask who is there, what are the bacteria there? We can ask what they are doing or what they are able to do through metagenomics or metatranscriptomics by looking at the RNA of these bacteria or metaproteomics by looking at the proteins from these bacteria or by looking at metabolomics. And all of these are omics sciences. You can just look at all the metabolites in urine, for example, and you will be surprised that maybe one third of them sometimes doesn't come from our human enzymes. They come from the effect of microbial enzymes on drugs. Uh, same about blood, like a lot of metabolites in our blood come from uh, microbial products. So that's just, you can guess that the, the gut microbes and 
can affect our liver enzymes, it can affect the drugs directly. And there are so many examples uh, of this. I want to name a few because of the time. I just I will just name them. Just acetaminophen, which is Panadol or Paracetamol or Tylenol in different countries. It is affected uh, by microbes. Digoxin, which is an important glycoside for like treats heart disease, it's heart failure. It, it could be degraded by the bacteria. So some patients could never respond to it. And it's very risky. And some anti-cancer drugs, and even an anti-HIV drug, tenofovir was found to be less e e efficacious in African women because we carry different bacteria called Gardnerella. So my, my students and I built a database since we, we got interested in this. Actually, it, it's approaching its 10th anniversary. It was released on 11, 11, 2011. We just picked the date because it was exciting to the students especially. Uh, the, the, the website is free to access. Anybody can go to it. It's called pharmacomicrobiomics. Uh, you can just click pharmacomicrobiomics.com and you get there. You can search. It has over 100 relations now between different drugs. You can just search for a drug by name or you can just browse through the chemicals or publications and find all the relations. Just one example here. If you look at digoxin, there are three papers supporting uh, the relation between bacteria and digoxin. And uh, you can read details and you can go to the paper if you, because maybe, you know, you, you won't be convinced by the relation here. So you can go to the original paper describing this. All right, I, I'm, I'm getting close to, to ending my talk here. So again, what, what was I saying? So we have a cloud of uncertainty because we have a lot of microbes who interfere with our metabolism, whether we want it or not. They, they're actually pivotal to our health. They, you cannot be healthy without some of your microbes, but also sometimes they cause uh, unfortunate events. And, and they also now affect, I mean, we, we have known for a long time that microbes can degrade drugs, but now it, it, it's a focus of research. And it's very important in develop, developing new drugs. Um, and I just want to add one concept is that it's not just, uh, we're not talking just about drugs that we are taking, like sometimes vitamins or over the counter and even food. So for example, this is a research I'm involved in with a colleague, Dr. Mohamed Farag. Uh, he's actually helping us look at the effect of polyphenols, which you can find in green tea and in pomegranate and like all these nice, nice healthy foods and how they can reverse the carcinogenic effects of polyaromatic, which you can see on the left, like when you eat grilled meat and there is a lot of charring there, it tastes yummy, but it, it's, it's carcinogenic actually. So. <laughs> We are studying how these polyphenols can reverse the effect. And my grad student, uh, her name is Heba, she, she's looking at, there is a big difference here, just to check without any details, two, two slides, two, two different graphs. There are two different classes of bacteria that one of them goes up and the other goes down when, when we feed the rats this pomegranate for a long while. So it's really interesting. Uh, now I, I just want to conclude my talk and what is coming next? It's really hard to predict the future, but uh, a few years ago, we tried to, to have like crystal ball. <laughs> in 2010, actually, we tried to predict what medicine will look like when what personalized or precision medicine will look like uh, with knowledge of the microbiome. And uh, we, we, it was in the paper uh, by Rizkalla et al. If you want to look it up, uh, the preprint is available for free. And we just predicted three things, which I think they're almost coming through now. Personalized probiotic cocktail. So if you're in a cancer hospital, for example, and your patients are responding really poorly, uh, I mean, they're responding well to chemotherapy, but they're also having a lot of side effects, adverse effects. You can have, a, and this is happening, personalized nutrition. You can just give each, of them, give each of them a mixture of probiotics and different types of food that will be ideal to restore their natural microbiota so that they... Uh, handle these drugs better with less side effects. Personalized phage cocktails is already happening. You can make phage, bacteriophage cocktail, which are bacterial viruses. Like let's say uh, a clostridium, a type of clostridium bacteria or E. coli is specifically known to be hepatotoxic or carcinogenic and it's there in, in our intestine. We detected it. You can use, it's a very, it's like smart, war, you know, there is no smart war, but there is smarter war. Instead of just throwing the bomb on a village, you just can target uh, a specific place like a weapon, an armed uh, you know, uh, storage unit or something with a very smart uh, targeted weapon. So this is what we do, like bacteria, not like what scientists do in that field, bacteriophages, specific viruses, they just go and kill 
uh, eliminate the specific type of bacteria that may cause cancer. And maybe very soon you will go to the doctor and do some resist tomography, like just look at your intestine and see how many resistant bacteria to different antibiotics that are even harmless bacteria, but that this will alert you that when you take the next antibiotic, it, you may not respond to it because the harmless bacteria will be able to degrade it. So all this uh, could have been science fiction in 2010, but it's getting very close to reality now. Uh, I took a, about five minutes more, so I, I apologize for this, but I, I really was, was and still am excited to share with you Pharmacomicrobiomics is a new field relatively, but it describes a very well-known phenomenon that microbes are very capable of metabolism. They degrade drugs, they degrade poisons, they degrade pollutants. And our cells are surrounded by a lot of these microbes. They are like a cloud. They are full of wrapped in uncertainty. However, when we work hard on decoding them using a combination of human and computer tools, human knowledge and computer tools, we get a lot of reward. We, we learn a lot and we save, hopefully, save and will save a lot of lives or ease uh, the life of so many, especially because I work in a cancer hospital, like if we can just make the children's life better by giving them better nutrition that restores their microbiome. So we are at the stage of really translating pharmacomicrobiomics into better pharmaceutical and clinical applications. Uh, and I hope many of you will be interested in this field and we learn uh, how to do it so that it becomes routine in the clinic like so many pharmacogenetics are now routine. So at some point, maybe a stool sample from a patient can uh, improve their health and therapy. I thank you so much for your attention and uh, I welcome any questions if you send it to me through the email provided. And I'd like just to acknowledge case by pictures and names all these students and postdoctoral uh, trainees who helped me with all the work that I mentioned. And I'd like to thank the organizers uh, one more time for inviting me to this great event. Thank you.